Welcome back to part two of two. This is the Story Punks podcast, the show where we talk about all the punks. So steampunk, diesel punk, cyberpunk, and all the other punks. Today we're talking about time travel specifically, and this can really encompass things like alt history or other anachronistic terms you may have heard. So it's all part of how we punk different time periods and the technologies and all that good stuff. So welcome back. I am speaking with Nathan Van Koops in this interview, and I'm really excited to get into more specifics about his pilot experience and so much more as we get into part two. So again, if you didn't start with episode 45, go ahead and do that now. It'll make a lot more sense. I will also remind you to please go check out storypunks.world forward slash Zazzle, which is a popular site where you can customize stuff. And a lot of people have heard of Zazzle. You've used it for business cards or what have you. But there's actually also some really cool retro themed gifts and things that you could put to you know motivate you about your story that you're writing and customizing things in that way can be really, really cool. You know, it doesn't always have to break the bank. That's why I like Zazzle is because there's things at all different price points and it's really, really affordable as far as customization goes. So again, go to storypunks.world forward slash Zazzle, and that's spelled Z-A-Z-Z-L-E. That way I get a little bit of a boost, a commission for sending you their way. And I would really appreciate that. So other than that, let me remind you about Audible as well. So I actually listen to audiobooks Everyone who has followed episode to episode knows this, but I do have a lot of people that join just for certain episodes. So please know that if you have not yet checked out my running list of audible or audiobook recommendations, I keep that over at storypunks.world forward slash audible. So that's because it's so much easier for me to read a lot of these punk related works we talk about through my ears. It allows me to multitask and you can find stuff from Nathan Van Koops. I've added him to my running list and that's where you can get my recommended reads for summer or whenever you are listening to this. So go check it out. And so without further ado, we have so much more to cover when it comes to time travel and how to not fall into some of the pitfalls of storytelling when it comes to time travel and so much more. So let's get right into it. Here's part two of my discussion with author Nathan Van Koops. Okay, well, let's talk about one of your adventures specifically. So I'm going to talk about a term you've already alluded to just chatting today, but also in your book description for Faster Than Falling, you had this term that I loved called the aerial ocean. And I thought that was so cool because yes, they're airships, all the things that steampunks love and all that. But how specifically has your aviation career informed that? So both this oceanic thing, but also, you know, the aviation and all that. Yeah, absolutely. That was one of the big um, inspirations for sure for that adventure story, because when I was younger, um, I had my very first flying job was I was uh, a traffic patrol pilot up in Baltimore area. And I flew this guy named Detour Dave and we would fly around in a little airplane and I would do morning and afternoon rush hour traffic. And I was just buzzing around the beltway 1400 feet. That was my designated altitude that I was at every day. And I was, uh, my plane was called broadcast four and we would just go up there and every day we were just hanging out and it, it was exciting, but it was also a little bit dull and monotonous, you know, and my mind would wander sometimes because I was kind of the same old deal, just circle the belly. And, uh, but sometimes things would float by me. Like every once in a while I'd get balloons, like people would <laughs> let go of balloons and they would just sort of be drifting around up there. And I would get the biggest kick out of this. I'm like, ah, oh, there's another one. Because they just sort of, people think that they go up and they just vanish and go nowhere, but, or they, you know, somehow go into the atmosphere, but they go up to a certain point and they just sort of hang out up there. And then they're just drifting around and, you know, they happen to be at my altitude a lot. So um, I thought, well, that's kind of cool. Like it gives you a sense of perspective of how fast you're flying, how fast you're moving, if there's something else up there with you. Yeah. Which is why I love airships. I, anytime I get up in the air and there's a, a blimp um, out there, it's just some, so cool to see something so big 
up there in the sky with you. Um, or even just things, you know, sometimes you fly over top of airports and you'll see big planes landing underneath you. And it gives you a sense of perspective to the fact that you are flying and it's so much fun. Um, so the idea kind of brewed around in my mind and I thought, well, what if there was stuff up here all the time? How cool would it be if there was just stuff living in the sky and we could you know, have adventures up here the way that you do on the ocean? And of course, I watch a lot of um, nature documentaries like Planet Earth and um, Blue Planet, things like that. And you get, there's so many amazing creatures in, on our planet. But um, I kind of came up with this world of, okay, what if these sort of things started living in the sky? What would that be like? What if there was, you know, whales up there or, um, you know, all the different things that could potentially live in the sky. And I came up with this particular race of people that lived in the sky called the Skylighters. And they basically, they light up, they're, you know, bioluminescent and they can float. Like they can sort of bob around up there because they're, you know, they would need to if you live in the sky. Right. So I came up with this adventure, this world where these people existed. And then I, and I populated that world with some human colonists too, who were uh, learning to fly because the ground is a really dangerous place and not somewhere you really want to be. There's dangerous animals, there's, you know, sand pits and all kinds of dangerous things on the ground. So they're learning to fly but now they're kind of running into a conflict with these native people who live in the sky being like, no, the sky's ours. Yeah. Like, no, well, we really need to be up here. We don't want to die. So like there's this basic colonist versus native thing going on, but also it's this uh, who's going to own the sky question. And I just, it's a lot of fun to write just to let your imagination kind of run wild in that sort of scenario. So that's where my mind wandered when I was up flying around and, and still frequently does. So um, I'm excited. To, there's only one book in that series out so far, but I have um, three more planned. So it'll be a, a bit fun, imaginative universe to, to play around in. Oh, absolutely. That is a really cool concept. So thanks for sharing that. And it made me think... I'm totally riffing here so we can cut this if, if this is a question, but <laughs> just like there are sometimes things in different genres that are our pet peeves and stuff. What mm. have you seen in steampunk and stuff like that? Or it could be any kind of story where because of your aviation background, you're just like, uh, that's not how it would be. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, that's, that's tough. Cause I write in science fiction and I find that science fiction readers are very particular about the rules of a reality and how things work. Um, and we want things to make sense. And I'm the same way. I want things to make sense. I think the main thing that I want to see is consistency in a story that if you establish the rules and you tell me what the rules are, that you have to stick by those rules. I'm okay with bending the laws of reality. For example, in, in my adventure series, like my, my steampunk series, I basically created some gases that if you're a chemistry major, they probably couldn't exist. They probably couldn't be that light and have airships be this small. Um, I made up some elements that you know probably couldn't be lighter than hydrogen in real life. But if you take that one leap with me, the rest of it makes sense. Very Same cool. with time travel. It's like, if you say time travel is possible, <clears throat> then all these other things are possible. But I want there to be rules. Like, for example, in my time travel series, I'm very particular about space and the relationship between space and time, like you can't just willy nilly go jumping around because the planet's moving. So if you were to jump from where you're sitting right now to where you, you, you know, to tomorrow, guess what? You're in outer space because the planet moved at an astronomical speed while you were gone and is now thousands upon thousands of miles away and you're drifting, you know, and you're dead. So <laughs> you have to account for that. You know, you can't just go blinking around all over the place, over the planet. Uh, it bothered me and the time traveler's wife where he would just sort of, willy-nilly show up in a field somewhere oh, yeah. and I'm like well that's great I mean sure he's showing up naked sure he lost his clothes that makes sense that's fine but who moved the grass yeah like, why is there not grass like through his legs right now he just appeared magically a first off how did he land on the planet like I said and <laughs> number two like how did the grass know to move for his arrival like it wouldn't you know like it would get totally embedded in him so those sort of things would bug me so I was very particular about you know, when I created this time travel system that they had to time travel in conjunction with something that wasn't moving. So um, say, for example, if you're sitting in your chair right now and I move your chair, guess what? You're going to end up where your chair will be. Like if you were, if that was your anchor that you were using as a kind of anchoring point in time, 
if someone takes your chair and throws it in the ocean, guess what? You're going to end up in the ocean. So I was, I have a lot of fun with that. So you kind of play with teleportation along with, you know, time travel. And I, I was very particular that you have to account for space while you're accounting for time. And um, those are the same kind of things. Like as long as people or an author establishes the rules in a way that makes sense and then doesn't go, go around breaking their own rules, then I'm happy. I love that. That's a really succinct way to say it and to give people who are creating in this genre or adding it to a, one of their storylines, something to go off of where you just need to establish the rules and, and then continue and be consistent. I love it. You can definitely have fun with the rules. I mean, if you, if you want to break a major law of physics or something, that's fine, but give us a reason, you know, give us something to go on and then, you know, we'll go along with the ride. We'll take that one leap. But it's funny because <clears throat> people will make that leap of, Oh, sure. Time travel is possible. And they'll go on all these imaginative adventures with me. Then they'll say, oh, but you forgot to account for the vacuum of air that would be left behind when this person jumps. I'm like, or you forgot to account for bugs. I'm like, you know what? I thought about it, but at some point you just have to take this leap, you know? So draw that line wherever you want it and then let people know that's where the line is. And then, you know, then you'll be fine. Yeah, they should be okay with it. Very cool. Well, okay. Anyone who's listened to this so far, I hope that if time travel hasn't been your thing or you're just looking for something new to read, you'll head over to Nathan's site. We'll give you all the links and everything toward the end. But I do have some questions for creators. So mm -hmm. one thing I noticed, actually, this could be for readers as well, but I noticed that you have some novella length books, which are shorter mm -hmm. than novel length for most writers. And I just wondered what informed that. Maybe it was just the way the story wanted to be told. Maybe it was because you've seen something, some kind of trend among what readers want. Where did that mm. come from? Well, I think there's certainly a lot of uses for shorter books. And in my case, most of my books are really long. I write these, you know, 150, 200,000 word long books. They're, they're massive. And uh, it was because I couldn't seem to manage to come up with a smaller story. <laughs> but then um, there was a little idea in my second book, The Chronothon, that I kind of wanted to play with that I had mentioned briefly, but I hadn't really fleshed out. So I kind of thought, man, I really wanted to play with it. I never really had a chance to take that idea and run with it. So I took that little concept out of the main series and did a little spinoff series or storyline with it. And it was, you know, a um, short little 10 chapter thing. And but it was fun. It had the basic elements of the world, but was something that I could, you know, give away to subscribers or do other things with and kind of be a, almost like a sampler, a taster of, of what this world is like. And I think there's, if you're an author, that's a very valuable thing to do is to give somebody a, a sample before you ask them to commit to this, you know, whole long series. Um, let them try that out or, and also just use it as a, as a playground for yourself to, flesh out these little side stories because maybe you're doing some side writing and you want to develop a character, but it, that stuff doesn't really have a place in the main narrative of the novel, but it's still good writing. It's still a good concept. Like let yourself play with that as a creator. And then um, it adds depth to your world. Even if no one ever reads it, even if you're just writing it for yourself, like you are getting to know your characters and their backgrounds and their stories so much um, better. And, or you can write it, use it as an epilogue, for example, like if people have read your story, but they want just a little bit more, you know, add another little side story on the back, uh, you know, a year later, this is what happened, you know, things like that. It's definitely valuable. Very, very cool. Thank you. And another yeah. creator question, which could also be a reader question, but you've been really active on Facebook. And so... Mm -hmm. I understand you have a web series on there, a video series, so it's episodic, mm -hmm. and I want you to tell us about that. But also, what advice do you have for readers who may be shying away from connecting with their authors on Facebook or their favorite authors on Facebook or vice versa, authors okay. connecting with readers? I think that this is an amazing time to be a writer and to be a reader because we have such direct access to the creators of content and we have the opportunity to build relationships, not just, um, you know, move products or, you know, communicate through products. We have, we have way to actually legitimately communicate. And one of the things that's important, I think to readers and to, to, to writers is to develop these, you know, reader relationships because we're not just creating, you know, fans of our stories, we're creating fans of us and who we are and, and what it is we're trying to get across. And when people like your books, 
that's fine. But if they like you, they'll usually like everything you write because they support you as the author. And um, it's not, it's not, it's not self-serving because like you're, you're giving back, like you're listening to your readers. You're maybe um, asking your readers to give feedback on uh, one of the things I do in my Facebook group. I have a Facebook group called Tempest Fugitives. And it's a lot of time travel fans who are there and they want to interact with me. And I do, um, you know, every other week I do a little time, happy time travel Tuesday video and we chat and talk about things and um, communicate. It might just be on, on what I'm working on, but it might be fun other time travel stuff, movies we've been watching, things that other books I'm reading in the genre, people, you know, we just want to learn about you as the author and what the world behind the scenes is like. So that's fun to share. But I've also learned a ton from my readers who are, you know, very knowledgeable on certain subjects. Um, I've got one reader named Mark who is um, into like armor and tournaments and things like that. I'm like, you know, old medieval style weaponry. Like, so he's a, a massive source of information and just a, a great person to chat with if I ever have questions about facts. I've got another series I'm working on that's like sort of a sword fighting series. So um, you never know what people are going to share with you. And you also just develop these sort of deeper connections with, with people and, and it becomes a real relationship and a real friendship, which um, can take, you know, a lot of time and energy, but it also, it's, it's less so because of Facebook, because of, you know, social media and ways where you can just put yourself out there and you'd be surprised at how much um, people like that and want to interact. It's not for everyone, for sure. Um, but it's a little bit more personal than just an email newsletter or something like that. But I definitely encourage people trying it out. And then, and of course, video like this and, and audio is a great way too, because hearing someone's voice and seeing their face is a whole other way to get to know someone. And it's so much more personal than just reading words on a page. So I, I definitely encourage everyone to try it. I totally agree. And you know what I thought about as you were saying that was we're talking at people so much in the writing profession, <laughs> we're talking mm -hmm. at them. And then there's a whole time, you know, um, I guess that's not really a pun, but there's a whole time yeah. Yeah. factor where it's asynchronous. And so mm -hmm. I think it's really cool to, to take advantage of what our technology allows us to do now and to have not just a, I'm talking to you, I'm informing you, I'm entertaining you. I mean, there's a lot of that because you're telling a story, but there's also right. that feedback loop. And I love that. That's so cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And like I said, you'd, you'd be amazed. I'm t I've decided um, through this experience that I'm terrible at judging my own covers. <laughs> like I, I, whenever my cover designer comes back with a couple of different designs for me, I, I look at them and I'm like, Oh, it's clearly going to be this one. But then I'll go and, and post them up in the group and say, Hey, who wants who A or B and invariably everyone will choose the one that I didn't pick. And you know, 80% of the people will be out oh, clearly this one. And I'm like, Oh gosh, well, these are the readers. These are the people that I'm actually trying to write the story for. Okay. So, that's really I'm, compelling. I'm gonna, yeah. I'm going to choose the one that you know they want and it's going to, the book will probably do better and we'll get more fans and more people will get to enjoy it. And um, you know, it, it's all around better because you just ask for help, ask for opinions. And uh, I found that very valuable. Do you feel like it takes off some of the pressure as well of, this is my baby. I'm making my baby perfect the way I'm conceptualizing this. And because mm -hmm. you're getting some buy-in ahead of time. Yeah, you definitely are. And I've done an, an interesting thing. Well, last year, um, as I was writing my fourth time travel book, The Warp Clock, I actually was uh, posting chapters as I went with a, uh, a special Facebook beta, beta team. That's cool. And I had um, at least probably 80 people read it in advance. And they were giving me feedback as I wrote it. So they were giving, and a couple of them were you know, proofreading and doing, uh, I had a couple that were amazing proofreaders and just found every little possible typo or punctuation mark that was, that was misplaced. So that I, not only did I have a lot of confidence publishing it because it had been read by almost 100 people and had so many eyes on it, but I also knew what they liked and what they didn't like and things that had been confusing, ways that I could iron out uh, particular issues and make sure that everyone was happy for the to have the book out so that there, it did get rid of those butterflies. Like, okay, I'm going to hit publish on this thing. Is anyone even going to like this book? Right. Um, I already had a slew of readers who were totally invested and I knew that they were going to go out and evangelize because they got a chance to read it first. Of course I put their names in the book and stuff. So it was um, a lot of fun. 
That's so cool. Thank you for sharing that. That's really, really awesome. So obviously you've been really immersed in steampunk, really immersed in time travel, and I'm sure it's changed you as a person. Would you just share with us what writing in this genre has meant to you? And also if you have any aspirations for where you'd like it to take, I guess, humankind. I mean, if that's not too big of a, of an aspiration. (laughs) No, I mean, I think you have to think big picture when it comes to time travel, a lot of, um, a lot of the genre is about asking those big questions. And part of it is, you know, things like what would I do differently is a, is a valid question that comes up a lot in those types of time travel stories. If I could do my life over again, oh yeah, uh, what would I change? Would I change anything? Like, um, what would happen if I, you know, had a different partner? Would I end up with different kids? Like, there's a lot of different choices you can make throughout your life, but it makes you think about that. One of my favorite um, sort of moral lessons that came in the terms of time travel was from the movie about time. I don't know if you've watched that one. Yes. Uh, it's got Rachel McAdams and um, is it Domhnall Gleeson? I think his name is. I don't is know the his name, actor? but it's the tall yeah. blonde guy. Yeah. And then, so he is able to travel back and his, his dad is able to travel back too. And his, his relationship with his dad is an amazing um, part of that movie. But the moral lesson basically at the end is, is he ends up going back and, and reliving each day, one day at a time, and, but appreciating those things that um, make your life special. And by having that sort of second, taking a second look at it, you realize what is and isn't important about your life. And it also kind of, I think a lot of time travel is a lens. A lot of this, a lot of reading in general, but time travel is a lot of times is a lens and it puts it over this particular story. And usually the lesson that the time traveler learns isn't the lesson that they set out to, to learn. It's not like, for example, in that movie, he set out to get a girlfriend, but what he learned was how to appreciate his daily life without time travel. And it was, it was an interesting way. And that's typically the way it is. We go on an adventure to find out what it is we need to learn about our daily normal life. And every time we read one of these books and go off on uh, one of these wild adventures, it teaches us something about us. And um, so for me, that's kind of like the lesson of time travel is that kind of actually grounds you back in the now eventually. And if you're paying attention, that's where the lesson is. And um, it's something that helps you kind of focus on each little moment that we have passing by because it is a gift. I mean, every day we get is a gift and uh, what we do with it is, you know, a new adventure every day. Um, but the, but the lesson is there, you know, to, to appreciate it. Oh, that is so well said and a wonderful place for us to end, even though I wish we could just keep talking about this. So Nathan, yeah. where can people go to find out more about everything we've talked about today? Well, uh, my name is Nathan Van Koops. It's uh, two words, V A N C O O P S. And I'm the only one there is. So it's, I mean, it's super easy to find. Um, on the internet. I'm NathanMancoops.com. I'm Nathan Van Coops on, on Amazon, on Facebook and Twitter and all the, all the great places people find people. And um, I'm happy to, to chat. If anyone has questions for me, if you want to shoot me a message, I'm always, I do have the Tempest Fugitives Facebook group. So if people are interested in time travel and, and uh, want to see what that group's all about, that's where they can find me there. Oh, so wonderful. Okay. Well, thanks again and have a wonderful time writing about time. All right. I will. Uh, Thanks again for having me. This has been a lot of fun. So there you go. Time travel in a nutshell. (laughs) It's such a huge topic. And Nathan did such a great job of covering so many different things that will come up as we write these stories or, um, you know, just things about writer lifestyle, which I absolutely love. So again, thank you to Nathan Van Koops for his time. And please do go check out his site because it's really cool. You can get two free stories and then it's, he just has some really fun wordplay right there on his main site, nathanvancoops.com. And it says, take a trip through time, get two free stories now, plus more in the future. So (laughs) that's really cool. And you can join his uh, newsletter and be in touch with him. So other than that, I hope you have a wonderful week. Again, even if you are thinking that you might be interested in my editing services, sign up for my newsletter. So it is storypunks.world forward slash newsletter. And you'll see it's really easy to just sign up there and you will get more information in the emails that come. So keep your eye on email. I'll leave you with that. I'm so excited by the windy day going on outside. So 
I'm looking forward to getting out, going for a bike ride. <laughs> it's kind of the theme as I'm trying to strengthen my leg and I've been swimming a lot and this was a really good week. I've been feeling my leg get stronger and stronger and that's really encouraging. I've had such a hard time with a past injury with it. So um, just wanted to kind of celebrate that and I hope that's an analogy for how our riding lives are getting stronger. <laughs> Even when we don't feel it every week, then there will be that week where it just feels awesome. So whether it's that week, this week for you, or whether it's coming, I wish you the best and stick with it. Have a wonderful week until episode 47.